As we embark on a new year with new resolutions, us men must remember that victory in life does not lie in ignoring our failings, but in steady and constant healing and purification of our desires. Today, we have on an incredible guest, an expert in the Desert Fathers, to discuss the only real purpose of our resolutions, purification of self, good and appropriate plans for success, and the overall rising from sin to holiness. We hope you enjoy. Today's episode is being sponsored by Exodus 90, a group that is doing a great job giving men a strategy to grow in holiness. More on them and their work later. Welcome, gentlemen, to another episode of the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. Uh, as John said in the teaser, we are excited to talk about New Year's resolutions. This is the time of year that a lot of people are thinking about uh what changes they want to make in their life spiritually and physically and maybe otherwise but people are thinking about a new chapter a new beginning um and and uh, of course we could do this at any time but for some reason this time of year really just inspires those thoughts of of change and renewal and that's okay so we're going to talk about that with um our guest who uh is very well schooled in the spirituality of the eastern uh, Christian Church, as well as um, the Desert Fathers and uh, and early Christianity and the asceticism and prayer that that uh, is uh, so beautiful in that tradition. And uh, so we're joined today by Father David Abernathy. Uh, and Father David converted to Catholicism as an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh, where he earned his bachelor's degree. He also has a master's degree in sacred theology and divinity and has spent many years as a priest studying clinical counseling and psychoanalysis at the Pittsburgh Psychoanalytic Center, where he is an academic candidate. In 1987, Philip, uh, Philip Kalia was given to Father David as a gift, and this gift sparked a love for the Desert Fathers and Eastern spirituality that Father David has developed for over 30 years, and he has a particular interest in the works of St. John Cassian, St. John Climacus, and St. Isaac the Syrian. Father David was ordained to the priesthood in 1994, and up until very recently was um, uh, at the oratory of St. Philip Neri there in Pittsburgh, but uh, recently transitioned to uh, being a Byzantine Catholic priest in the Archeparchy of Pittsburgh, and maybe he can share a little bit about kind of that transition um, um, later in the episode. But thank you so much for being with us, Father David. No, it's, it's a real pleasure. I'm glad we finally have the opportunity to get together again and uh, to follow up on our first episode. It's been, it was a real pleasure, and um, so I'm glad we're able to get together once more. Wonderful. Yeah, and if you if anyone's listening hasn't listened to our first episode with Father David, please look that up. It was it was an excellent episode that was, um, I think you'll find very enlightening and encouraging to your spiritual life. So, but yeah, I guess just to, to jump jump right in, like, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about um, your, you know, we talked a little bit about it in the introduction, but your interest in Eastern Christian spirituality. I mean, a lot of times uh, Western Catholics, uh, unfortunately, aren't very familiar with this tradition. Um, they think that, you know, uh, the Roman expression or the Western expression of Catholicism is is Catholicism and that there's really nothing else. And uh, you spent a great deal of your ministry uh, introducing people to the riches of Eastern Christianity, which are very much a part of our Catholic tradition. So could you just tell us, share a little bit more about um, what drew you to this expression of, of spirituality and uh, theology and asceticism and all, all that goes with that and uh, kind of how you've developed in that over the years? Absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, it was as a very young man that I was exposed to the Philokalia. And I think in our first meeting, I had mentioned that I was a novice at the time. And so only about 21 years old when I was given uh, mm -hmm. the first three volumes that were in uh, print at that point and translated into English. 
since then, uh, the other volumes have been translated, as well as many other materials uh, that we have available to us. So we live re really in a wonderful age in that regard. We have so much that is accessible to us now in English and that's been translated within the last 25 years that wasn't available even when I started reading 35 years ago. So we find ourselves in a wonderful position of having access uh, to many of the fathers, especially uh, Isaac the Syrian, which just recently all of his writings have been translated into English in, in the last 20 years. So mm. a beautiful time uh, to... Uh, be a Catholic Christian and have access to what's part of our patrimony, what's part of our heritage as Christians. And it's interesting that I found over the course of time that it's not only Western Christians, but Eastern Christians, Eastern Rite Christians also, they may have heard about these writings and know that they're part of the Eastern tradition, but not really have had any access to them. Uh, simply because they are Eastern Rite Christians does not mean that uh, this spiritual uh, element of the, of the writings of the, of the fathers have been passed on to them by their pastors or that within their parishes that they've had groups. And similarly, I think with many priests that I've met over the course of the years, uh, Eastern Rite Catholics as well as Orthodox, that they were exposed to these writings within seminary, but would not see it as fitting uh, for a number of different reasons to expose their parishioners to it. And so uh, we have a couple of generations, I think, that have never been exposed to these writings of the ascetic life, and uh, and including priests. And it's an unfortunate thing because it's at the heart of our spiritual tradition and everything is tied to it. Uh, everything in our spiritual tradition has its roots in the monastic literature. That goes back to some of the ones that you mentioned, Cassian, Clamacus, uh, Isaac the Syrian, uh, St. Anthony the Great. Uh, it's here that we begin to see the development of the spiritual life and the internal life, uh, and also how to struggle with the things that we are, find ourselves uh, battling against on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I think this is what attracted me uh, to the, this tradition is praxis the practical mm. aspect of the spiritual life that the fathers put forward. It's not speculative. They entered into the desert as a kind of laboratory, if you will. And in one fell swoop, they set aside so many of the things, I think, that become for us distractions, even if they're good. They, you know, removed themselves from the company of men, uh, but of society as a whole, but also the comforts. Uh, of the world uh, and uh, had to live in a very bare bones way within the desert. And But in doing so, they are also confronted with what was going on on an internal level as never before, that there was nothing there to distract them from that relationship between themselves and God, but also seeing how the human mind and heart work, how easily we move uh, from one thing to another in our thoughts, how easily we are tempted uh, to fulfill our desires, our passions, uh, the longings that we have as human beings that have not been touched by the grace of God and so lead us away from him. And so it was that practical element, especially as a young man, uh, that I found so helpful. I'd never been exposed to uh, this tradition at all. Uh, it came from a family of faith but not one not in touch with the spiritual tradition. And uh, and even after becoming Catholic, that was true as well. And so I found myself struggling as any young man does, uh, or young woman for that matter, you know, in college these days, that we are subject to so many things uh, that give rise to the passions. And I think in our last episode, we talked about being in a constant state of receptivity, Mm -hmm. through all of our senses, as well as what comes forward from our own intellect, imagination, and memory. And so how is it that we deal with these things uh, in accord with the gospel, that we might be attentive to the will of God, uh, the teachings of, of the gospel, and to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord? And so as a young man struggling, certainly with my own passions, finding within the fathers this rich insight into 
uh, how to deal with one's thoughts, how to strengthen one's will, uh, how, how to form the mind and the heart through the study of the scriptures, through the readings of the fathers, uh, living in obedience to a spiritual elder who has an experiential knowledge of the internal life. And uh, I think it changed my view of the active life also altogether, that for the fathers, the active life is not performing deeds of charity for others. That's certainly part and parcel of living out the gospel life, of loving others, of serving them. But the active life, in their view, was the struggle with the passions, seeking purity of heart. And so even before entering into a monastery, uh, they saw it necessary for a man perhaps to go un undergo years of trial uh, to purify the mind and the heart in order that he might take upon himself the monastic garb and not just don it as an external reality, but have a heart that has been formed uh, that is uh, that gives expression to what he takes upon himself and, and bearing the monastic habit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That he's already, in a sense, died to self, sin, to the world, wears black, which is a sign of mourning for one's sin. And uh, and so simply to embrace that in externals has no meaning or value, nor is one going to persevere in the life. And so we find this emphasis very early on, uh, on the importance of forming the mind and the heart. Uh, that we put on the mind of Christ and that we seek to order the passions and our desires in such a way that they find their ultimate fulfillment in, in Christ. And this is what gives us then the capacity to, to live out the gospel. And so I think as a young man experiencing a spiritual awakening, as you mentioned, coming into the church as a college student, uh, experiencing faith and witnessing that faith in others and witnessing the great love of the sacramental life. Uh, but when it came to day-to-day -day life, dealing with the some 40,000 thoughts that we have during the course of the day or with the distractions that come from uh, living in a university community and never having uh, learned how to still the heart or the importance of fostering stillness or simplicity. Uh, all of these things were lacking, and it was through the fathers that I began to see gradually the importance of them and begin to foster them. And over the course of time, uh, superiors in the community that I belong to uh, in the past were very supportive of it, as well as spiritual directors and uh, seminary formators, uh, that they deepened and encouraged this interest over the course of time. Yeah, no, I think that's excellent. And there is there's such a parallel to a lot of the Western um, uh, tradition as well. You talked about purification of the person, purification of the mind, the heart. And I know that uh, St. Francis de Sales in his introduction to the devout life, the whole beginning is all about purifying. You got to start there. We got to purify ourselves. Uh, Thomas Kempis as well in his his imitations of Christ is like, you know, you might <clears throat> even see that whole book as an act of purification of of your will for for Christ. Um, but there there's something that um, that you brought up on our last episode that was just so fulfilling for me as maybe it's it's the end goal right and having the desert fathers seem to truly have that end goal in mind not that not that western traditions not that a doctor of the church saint francis de sales didn't have this in mind um but there was something lacking in my own growth uh that it was just duty and purpose and obligation and you know um a requirement be with without that end goal of unity with christ in this world and i would say that since in the last year and a half i've been practicing a lot of what you were talking about with really having that union with christ in mind here and now things like um uh blessed are the poor in spirit started making a new sense to me right this 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 removal of the things of this world for they and 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 how in scripture it it says that um in holy writ that there's is the kingdom of heaven not 
not that it shall be or not that it will be, but that that it is now when we have this detachment from from possessions and everything. And so I guess just a lot of what you're saying is really sparking within me that love now that that you've uh, helped put into me, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. And I've listened to some of your uh, Philokalia, you know, podcasts and things of that nature. But let's let's direct to um, resolutions in general. And and, you know, the the society has resolutions at the beginning of the new year. We're all looking for a new person, a new self. Uh, we think about Lent, where the church is helping us with with those resolutions. Often these resolutions fail. I'd love to talk to you about, you know, why resolutions can be a good thing. And, and we can just start there. I'd love to hear from you um, with that. Very good. If you don't mind, if we can make a little segue into that. Please. I'd, I'd love to. to. Some of the things you said. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, you know, St. Francis de Sales and other writers like him, uh, the author of the uh, spiritual combat, Lorenzo Scopoli. Mm, the they were all formed in this tradition, and so they might not have articulated it in quite the same way. They had this understanding of the purgative aspect of the spiritual life deeply rooted within them, and because of their tie to the fullness of the spiritual tradition. Philip Neri, we mentioned the last time, uh, saw himself as a desert father living in the city, mm. and uh, so his favorite writers were Cassian and Climacus, and he carried on his person, the conferences of St. John Cassian. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole tradition that was formed in it, even as they were writing for their generation. So you have somebody like Francis de Sales, who's had enormous impact upon many generations of Christians. He was still connected to that fuller spiritual tradition. And as was Philip Neer, even though we don't have any writings from him, in his counsel of others, as well as in his personal life, this is what shaped him. And I think part of the issue is that the Desert Fathers are seen as archaic, mm. or that they have a negative anthropology. Or the, uh, the fact that they lived in the desert then makes them re removed mentally for us in, in the sense that how could th what they write in terms about their experience speak to us who live in the world? And so we have this tendency to see the fathers in, in this way. And what I've discovered over the course of time is that the language that they use is filled with desire, that they did not have a negative anthropology, but they had an honest anthropology. Mm -hmm. They had an honest understanding of what it is to be a human being, uh, living in a fallen world, subject to temptations and passions that are disordered. And for them, it was not only uh, a discipline uh, to bring those things into order, but a discipline that was driven by the desire and love for God. So over and over again, you find the word desire coming up within their writings. Uh, so it wasn't just fasting to punish the body or embracing vigils in order uh, to weaken oneself, uh, but rather to deepen that hunger and that thirst for Christ and for the life of prayer. And I think once that became clear to me, then I began to realize, I think what Philip Neary did, that their writings speak to our day and how it is that we are to order our life toward God and to deepen that desire and love for him. And so when we began to think about resolutions or talk about them, uh, we have to use this language of desire uh, if it is going to be distinctively Christian. If we're embracing resolutions, not simply for self-betterment yeah. or self-improvement, uh, or to even, even simply to bring a kind of order to a disordered life, that for all of us, our resolutions have a very personal element. They are meant to draw us closer to Christ, uh, to allow us to comprehend his mercy, his love, and then to be driven on in that light and in the pursuit of that love in order that we can also uh, share it with others, that we might bear witness to it in our words, our actions and deeds on behalf of others in their need. That we receive the wisdom of the gospel and the wisdom of the fathers, not for ourselves, 
uh, but to be able to, to share it with others as we hear it within the scriptures. And, uh, and so our starting point as we talk about resolutions, always has to be Christ. And I think this is true with anything in the spiritual life. Uh, we don't start with our own judgment, our own opinion, uh, or even from our own reading of the, the scriptures or the writings of the fathers. We start with he who is truth. And we seek to allow him to guide us along the path that is going to be most fruitful that he sees in his providence, that is going to bring about the greatest change within us. There's always a danger in the spiritual life, and especially uh, among those who are well-read, and uh, that we could read the fathers and be deeply immersed in them and have uh, an intellectual knowledge of them and hold that in mind. But our praxis, our practice of the spiritual life might, might fall short where we have not internalized what we've read. And so we have a lot of the fathers saying that uh, they've read one great uh, spiritual writer over the course of 20 to 25 years, every single day of their life. And one of them is mm -hmm. St. of the East, one page or one paragraph of St. Isaac the Syrian. And another one of his uh, uh, contemporaries said the same thing about Isaac and that he would not turn a page either of the scripture or of uh, St. Isaac until he had internalized and embraced what was taught. That he knew that simply to read it for intellectual knowledge uh, or to understand it only with the mind was pointless. That it had mm. to bear the fruit of drawing us toward Christ and to give our lives over to him to be obedient to the Lord, or it had very little worth or no worth whatsoever. In fact, I think we talked a little bit the last time that uh, that theology outside of this interior life and of making these specific resolutions to conversion of life becomes demonic theology, not necessarily mm -hmm. driven and guided by the Holy Spirit. And so as we make our resolutions, we want to be careful that we are praying about what it is that the Lord is guiding us to do, that it is fit with our station in life, uh, where we live, our particular vocation, uh, say for uh, living the married life or for celibate clergy or married clergy, a religious nun, that uh, our embrace of a specific resolution would be geared to our fulfilling that vocation in all of its fullness. And that the ascetic practices around that would be guided by wisdom and, again, not guided by our own judgment, that we would seek out the counsel of a confessor, a confidant, a spiritual director, uh, or reading the fathers. You know, it often comes up in my groups that we lack spiritual elders in our day. Yeah. And people search for years, decades, trying to find a spiritual director. Uh, but I think God provides. And so as we seek to make these resolutions, immersing ourselves in the writings of the scriptures as well as the fathers, we we take them as our spiritual fathers and allow them to guide us uh, in our, our practice of the faith. So Christ-centered. Uh, would be the beginning of our resolutions. And I think uh, the beginning of a new year is a natural time for people to make resolutions, yeah. to begin anew. And I think that's what makes it so attractive and uh, so powerful for people, that as we draw close to January 1st, people begin to think about how they lived their past year, the, the things that were lacking, what they would want to accomplish or change about their life. And so this kind of self-evaluation is a natural thing, but a good thing. Uh, it, however, often doesn't have the, the power to sustain itself. Often after a week, uh, you know, the exercise a bike or treadmill is covered with clothes or uh, the diet has been broken for one reason or another because of post-Christmas parties and uh, or even on a spiritual level. Uh, the deepening of prayer life or commitment to daily mass or frequent uh, divine liturgy often goes by the wayside. And uh, and so I think people run into some of the same struggles that they do 
at other holy times uh, for Christians during the year, Lent. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about last time, yeah. or the Nativity Fast that is practiced in uh, uh, the Eastern Rite, that uh, it is sort of like the winter Lent. And so it's the fasting is deep and rigorous during the 40 days le- leading up to Christmas. And uh, there's uh, to be a deepening of the prayer life then as well. Uh, but sometimes those resolutions do not endure. And uh, I think that's an important question for us to ask. Why? Yeah. And what would help to sustain them over the course of time and grow and deepen? Yeah, and so many so many things to reflect on there. But 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 I love that point about desire, um, like kind of drawing us drawing us in, drawing us deeper. Because I think, as John was saying, so often there's kind of a legal, obligatory, duty bound sense that well, I have to do this. You know, the church says we have to fast at this time, or we have to. Um, go to mass on this day like you know even the phrase like sunday obligation or something like sometimes right. steals the joy from some of these acts and i love i love feast days or or significant days in the church year like uh ash wednesday or something like that where it's not a holy day of obligation yet everyone still comes because there's a desire there and so i guess my question is is and this kind of speaks to the uh element of perseverance but what can we do to stoke those flames of desire because it's one thing to say well i want to i want to desire union with christ or something but there's so many things calling you know the americans see so many ads every day six thousand or so a day like so many things trying to stoke the flames of our desire in a worldly direction and it's so easy to succumb to that where it's like, oh, Amazon's got a sale going on or, you know, like you go to the store and like there's all these nifty gadgets and attractive baubles that, you know, the world's offering us to kind of numb us out spiritually. And even in best intentions, sometimes we get dragged in this horizontal direction and can completely lose sight of our desire for the, the, the spiritual direction or vertical dimension. And it's a, so how can we stoke those flames of desire and really foster that deep desire for union with Christ? You know, that holy arrows that the, the church fathers talk about. That how, how can we stoke the flames of that, that kind of drive that perseverance? Yeah, to have a kind of clarity about what it is that we desire. The last time we spoke a little bit about the word desire itself, meaning sense of lack or sense of incompleteness. And uh, and so whatever our desire is, we have this sense that we need something to fulfill a void within us. And so sometimes we'll develop that kind of desire for the things of this world. I need that new iPhone in order that I might be able to function more fully on a day-to-day mm-hmm. basis. And so we're driven to purchase it. And uh, and even with things that are more positive, we we look at those who are musicians, artists, athletes, academics. They have a very clear sense about what it is that they desire, and they run towards it and dedicate themselves completely. Uh, their whole identity becomes wrapped around it, and and each of them embraces a kind of discipline that goes along with that life as well. That to perfect themselves in their art or their sport or intellectually. They immerse themselves completely and they develop a kind of clear role, but have to remind themselves over and over again why it is that they're pursuing what they're pursuing and have uh, mentors and teachers and coaches asking them that question over and over again so that they maintain that clarity over the course of time. And so the church in in many ways should be putting that question before us every time we, we come to mass, who and what is it that you desire? Why do you come to this altar? Who is it that sits at this table? Who is it that serves? Is it love? Is it desire for the Lord that brings you here? Or is it something else? You know, is it seeking a kind of earthly peace 
or having all the bases covered, as it were, uh, or feeling that one is being protected uh, from the evil things of this world? Or is there something deeper within us that we've come to identify that can only be fulfilled by God, that only his love makes us whole as as human beings? And uh, we may have talked about this before, but St. Francis of Assisi, had a little prayer that he would say every single day. And I love it because of its simplicity. Uh, He would ask himself two questions. Who am I? And who are you, God? Hmm. And these simple questions were meant to bring a kind of clarity to him and his life. Who is God for him? And who is he as a human being? Is he embracing that identity fully in light of that relationship with God? Or has he turned in upon himself and made himself God? And so questions like this, the kind of self-examination on a day-to-day basis where we are asking ourselves, are we living the kind of life that will fulfill the deepest desire that we have as human beings? That if God has created us for himself, if we're made in his image and likeness, then it is he alone that is going to satisfy that deepest desire. Kind of like what uh, St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. That he came to see very clearly that all the things that he had pursued, no matter how good or no matter how powerful, never satisfied that deeper longing within his heart. He was always restless until there was this deeper commitment to Christ. And I think that is true for us. And uh, we have to be able to identify that restlessness and seek its fulfillment in Christ and have all the things that support us in doing so. Uh, We've become experts in finding ways to distract ourselves or to seek a momentary or passing fulfillment in something within this world. And we almost have this infinite capacity for self-delusion. We can find all the reasons that we need to pursue what it is that we want or would satisfy our appetites or our our desires uh, and even take the place of God. We become more and more adept at finding the reasons that will will take us there. And it leaves that void with us. And I think that's why so, so many struggle with a kind of depression, feelings of emptiness, even though they live in a state of abundance. Uh, because they're lacking the one thing that is necessary. So on a a daily basis, to remind ourselves who we are, who God is for us, uh, because this is what ultimately is going to shape our resolutions uh, and determine the resolutions that we we take upon ourselves. What What is going to lead me to that place where I am encountering Christ and giving myself over to him? as fully as possible? Am I taking this up out of that desire? And is it going to be satisfied in and through it? Yeah, no, I think that's really excellent. And, and I want to kind of stay on this, this path right here of sustaining because your comments on noise is something that everybody listening to this podcast, um, Sam and I have brought up frequently, you know, say a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And if listening to this podcast is not the best thing you can be doing right now with your time, go do whatever he's inspiring you to. And uh, because we are so distracted by noise. And so um, how do we, you, you, you have the desire, you're uh, dutiful in conscience, you're moving forward, you know, um, you have a sense of eagerness right now, but, but say you're six weeks along and then the life's noise and our failed flesh, you know, keep us from getting back on the horse. So many people that I come in contact with or myself included from time to time fall into a certain degree of despair or just kind of giving up, maybe not despair, but maybe just, you know what, uh, I'll get back at it next advent or something like that or next Lent and, and stuff like that. But that's that's not how the Desert Fathers lived, and that's not how you've encouraged us. I remember you saying on the last time we spoke that 
that these resolutions can't be episodic. They can't be just at New Year, just at Lent. Your body violently reacts to that. So how do you get back on the horse, so to speak? And um, what what are some general guiding principles that you would um, encourage men uh, to, to kind of stick with it throughout the year? I'd love to hear that um, in more depth. Just as our uh, relationship with Christ has to be concrete and that he has to be the beginning and end of these resolutions. Uh, so we we have to be concrete in the making of them and specific and draw us ourselves back to them over and over again. When we look at the monastic tradition, for example, uh, very early on, they would develop a role of life for themselves, uh, how they would eat, how they would pray, how they would sleep, how they would engage each other throughout the course of the day. Uh, how they would foster that silence or stillness uh, internally as well as externally. And so when we look to the monastic tradition, we find this really wonderful guide in that regard, maybe not in terms of the specifics of what we would do, but the need to be concrete and the need to have a role. I think what uh, allows our resolutions to break down is that our they're not specific enough, not concrete enough, and... Uh, and we allow room for ourselves uh, to let them drop, drop away altogether. Uh, you know, as I was saying, we, we can have this kind of delusion or illusion about the spiritual life so that when we begin to struggle with it and drop the resolution, often that's the end of it for us. Whereas for a person who's committed to Christ, who longs for him and his love, is going to take up that resolution again, humbly acknowledge the failure to maintain it, even to confess it, to make it binding for oneself. Mm. And I find myself offering this counsel over and over again to people that to be very concrete, to write down a role of life for yourself, uh, to hold it binding, to talk to your spiritual director about it, to talk to your confessor about it, so that when you come into the confessional, if you have dropped your fasting or you dropped your prayer role, you humbly acknowledge it before God and then seek the grace of the sacrament in order to step right back into it again. Uh, but even outside of the sacramental life, I think having uh, something concrete and that is written down as the role was uh, in the monasteries helps us when we do fall to immediately step back into what we've committed ourselves to. That if it's too vague, or if it's based solely on an inspiration in a moment, then once we struggle with it, it's going to fall away. But if it's concrete, simple, clear to its purpose, especially with the things that we struggle with, then we don't even have to think about it. After, say, we've grown weak and have dropped it, we turn our minds back to it and step right back into that discipline, perhaps in the same day. So not letting the spirit that comes to us uh, in those moments when we've fallen short of that role, not to shelve it, but to take up that role again, wherever we are in the day, and to fulfill uh, the remaining portion of it. And then to begin again the next day, and to do that as often as it is necessary until it becomes the norm for us. And that we would also see it as something that is to be practiced continuously. Uh, not for a period of time. You've brought up the word episodic here a number of times. Now, I think that is part of the problem, is that uh, with every other thing we do, as we've mentioned, uh, when there is a true desire for it, we practice it continuously throughout the year. And uh, But there is uh, no setting aside one's spiritual life. And so the spiritual practices to bear fruit for us cannot just be a test of endurance for 40 days, say of Lent. We have to see ourselves as entering into Lent as uh, a kind of a resolution itself, a renewal of a resolution to en engage in that relationship with Christ more fully, to take up the disciplines that lead us to him and help us to purify the heart. And then Lent itself becomes a springboard into living that commitment more fully and perfectly. So the end of Lent and the beginning of Easter or the end of the Nativity Fast and the celebration of Christmas should not be the ending 
of our spiritual disciplines. Uh, there obviously are times of celebration where we are celebrating the feast of Easter or, or of the Nativity, and that we would celebrate with others and break bread to eat with each other and have wonderful meals. All of that is natural, normal, and good. But I think the problem is, is that we let go of the disciplines altogether rather than seeing that period as tied again to our relationship with Christ and that we would want to, to deepen over the course of time. In fact, every year, and this is true in the monastery or within the world, that we would want to see a deepening and a perfecting of our asceticism. And that doesn't mean taking upon ourselves more and more things or disciplines. It means striving every year to engage in those practices more and more perfectly, to give our hearts over to Christ and to those disciplines more and more perfectly. And uh, and so we don't want to take on things that are unmeasured or too great a weight, but that which we can do and do well and that which is going to be formative and then lead to other things. We might find ourselves struggling with particular passions. And so our focus might be on certain disciplines that help strengthen our will and our desire for God in regards to those, and then build upon that over the course of time. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think what we, what sustains it is this sense of moving toward Christ and of deepening and perfecting that love for him and not engaging in our resolutions or our spiritual dis uh, disciplines in an episodic fashion. That we should be joyful in the taking up of these disciplines because they lead us to Christ and they lead us to a greater freedom in our loving and giving ourselves in love, both to him and to others. And so why would we want to let go of, of the things that bear such great fruit for us? Uh, even the monks will write that, uh, you know, the, the glutton rejoices when the bell for dinner rings, whereas the prayer uh, laments that he has to let off of the time of prayer and the stillness that it provided, that he was being nourished and fed uh, there in, uh, in this very deep way. And so to break off, to meet the needs of the body, was the times of frustration for the saints, or that they would find themselves praying for uh, 24 hours at a time, losing sense of time itself, because they were being so deeply nourished by engaging in that relationship. So, but all these moved from the episodic uh, to what was stable. Yeah. And it's stability that allows for growth. And, uh, you know, to commit oneself, uh, and we see this in every area of our life, whether it's in relationships or activities, but in the spiritual life, to commit ourselves uh, to something where we are clear that we're not going to let go of it allows for a deepening of the practice over time. Yeah. And uh, I think on the church's part, there is a need to articulate it. I think there's a, a hunger uh, for the richness of the spiritual tradition. And it's not as though these things aren't spoken about, but they're often spoken about as something that should be done, but not why they are done or how they are to be done or to be maintained. And this requires then that the church as a whole uh, steps back into the spiritual tradition as deeply as possible and nourish ourselves upon the writings of the fathers, of the great ascetics, in order that we might be able to sustain these practices and then pass them on to future generations. I think this is part of the problem that we have a few generations that have not been exposed to the spiritual tradition at all, and yet facing newer and greater challenges to the spiritual life. Um, you know, I, I find people that are addicted to certain uh, passions uh, since they were eight or nine years old, simply mm -hmm. because of the accessibility uh, yeah. to them. Pornography is one. And so how is it spiritually that we create a resolution that is going to help bring healing and hope there, 
and uh, but also help a person uh, do that in a sustained way, not to give up when they find themselves in the grip of something that is so powerful. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Exodus 90. If you don't know who Exodus 90 is, we strongly encourage you to check them out. They are a ministry for men that provide a roadmap for spiritual um, and actually physical growth. Exodus 90 is all about asceticism, prayer, and brotherhood. Now, those three pillars really form the basis of the program, but it's 90 days of spiritual exercises, readings, uh, getting together with your brothers and your fraternity that you choose. Um, and it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. I've done it a few times. Uh, and it can be hard. It can be demanding. But we need a little bit uh, of asceticism in our lives today. The church doesn't ask very much of us these days. And that's okay. But sometimes we need a little bit of an extra spiritual shot in the arm. And that's what Exodus 90 can provide. So there's a science behind why Exodus 90 is developed the way it is, right? Those 90 days have a purpose. But another great thing about Exodus 90 is that they also offer different variations. They offer a Lenten program. They offer different challenges over the summer. So basically, they have something that's there to fit your needs. Again, asceticism, prayer, fraternity, and really that roadmap that men find so helpful. I know that I did when I went through it. So we strongly encourage you to check them out at exodus90.com slash Catholic Gentleman, or click on that link in the show notes. You've touched on a little bit already, but I just would like a, a little, a few more thoughts on this. But this idea of like, we, we talked about desire and like, you know, the, and, and those moments when we feel that desire deeply, it can be really beautiful. Like there can just be this deep love for Christ and this desire for union with him. And, and we can really, that can really spur us on. But also I just want to talk a little bit too about just kind of the role of emotions in the spiritual life, because what I've seen is like, and, and I don't say this in any way as like a criticism, just an observation, but there's, you know, kind of as the Western tradition, we've kind of gotten away from our own Western roots, if you will. And like, there's kind of been a, uh, you know, since, since, you know, Vatican II and things like some of those traditions have fallen away that kind of gave shape to the spiritual life in the Western world. And so what I've noticed filling the void, having been a Protestant at one point in my life, like I've, I've kind of noticed this in a bigger way, but there's been kind of an insurgence of of evangelical style like praise and worship music during adoration or things like that where it's like and and i don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it it's just i feel like it's unsustainable in the sense that you go to adoration in like a big stadium and there's you know praise and worship music and there's the host and it's like can be a very emotional thing that kind of plays on um you know, your, 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 uh, emotional life to get it kind of stirred up and, and, and then you have an experience, but then you leave and all of those emotions go off a cliff and you just feel kind of dry spiritually. And then you kind of look for that next mountaintop experience of, you know, smoke machines and incense and like, and, and, you know, guitars and like, and it gets you kind of whipped up again. And then that sustains you for a little while longer and then you go off the cliff again. And I, and again, this is very much how like Protestant services often are, where it's like a big emotional experience. And then you, you know, you leave and then everything dies. And yet there is a role for emotions in the spiritual life. There is a role for, um, you know, just look at the Psalms. Like David was kind of all over the place emotionally. So, so while emotions can be very powerful and spurring us on, what do we do in those moments when we feel dry or numb or like we don't feel that intensity of desire? Like, what do we do with that as well? Like, so I just well, love your yeah, thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. Again, I think this is where the patristic psychology and anthropology is so important that you're right. Emotions are a part of who we are as human beings. And they're also part of the spiritual life, that the affective level uh, uh, that we enter into that relationship with God. And sometimes we will experience the sweetness of it, or we will experience the, the weightiness of our own sin and the sorrow for it that will draw us back to God. So the affective level is very important. Uh, the problem is, is if that is the sole source of guidance for us, 
And, you know, our generation is often driven uh, by the emotions and will, you know, express the emotions on this very, in this very public forum, too. And yet, uh, who we are as human beings uh, goes far deeper than that. It's, you know, we intellect, will, memory, imagination, uh, but also our, our faith where we are guided and directed by a gift of God that goes beyond understanding, goes beyond the limits of our reason and intellect, and also goes beyond the power of emotion to drive us as well. Uh, that emotion is not always going to be there. And so if that emotion dries up, where does that leave a person? Either feeling that God has abandoned them or that they have no faith whatsoever, and then the spiritual life dis dis dissolves. Um, it's often been said that a starving man has no sense of taste. And so where there's a void, something's na naturally going to want to fill it, and we are going to want to fill it. And so if the church has not been articulating the fullness of the spiritual tradition, uh, uh, liturgically or in one's private and personal life, then people are going to start to seek to fill that void with, with something or anything that is at hand. And so that which speaks to the emotion, or they'll gravitate to Eastern, not Eastern Christian, but Eastern religious practices that seem to hold out a kind of discipline there, or something that alter, alters one's mental state. You know, the practice of certain mantras or certain things that are even pretty close to what we do in a lot of our spiritual disciplines. But people begin to gravitate to, to them because nothing from the Christian spiritual tradition has been presented to them. And, uh, and so there is this void that's going to be fulfilled. And also, you know, in the spiritual life, there is no static position. So if we aren't engaging in the spiritual life, we are going to be drawn along by the things of this world or our emotions or our own limited understanding of things. And so if we aren't engaged in Christ in this very deep way through the, the spiritual and the ascetic life, we are going to be drawn along by the spirit of the world. And that's true within the life of the church as well. If we're not rooted in the fullness of our tradition, then all that we engage in and how we articulate the faith, how we uh, practice and engage in our worship is going to be influenced more by the things around us, by the spirit of this world than by the spirit of Christ. We're going to lose that capacity for discernment that we need. And so, you know, in the spiritual life, uh, we find within the fathers this realization that uh, who we are as human beings is going to have an impact upon our resolutions and our disciplines. And we have to take those into consideration that there are going to be days where we are engaged in prayer and we aren't feeling anything. And where we simply have to force ourselves out of that same desire for Christ, but force ourselves not because we are receiving something back that is clear to us on an emotional level, but because we have uh, generation after generation of saints and holy men and women who've spoken to us about the, the fullness that Christ gives in terms of the gift of his spirit, guidance, discernment, perseverance in times of trial. And they've given us the example of their having this kind of raw endurance at times where they can feel nothing whatsoever. I think we've all had that experience where we've gone through perhaps trial after trial or experienced failure or loss of loved ones. And we find ourselves not feeling anything in the spiritual life and are simply engaging in a kind of raw endurance of holding on, as the scriptures tell us, make sure that your endurance carries you all the way. And part of the reason that we are taught that is because uh, there are going to be times where we are not going to want to turn to God or turn to things that are holy, or that we're going to be so oppressed by 
the world, the suffering that we experience, illness, uh, again, loss, failure, things not going the way that we desire, that we simply have to hold on in hope to what God has promised us. And I think this is what, again, we learned from the spiritual tradition, our hope in what Christ has promised us through the cross, through the Holy Eucharist, the life, the love that endures unto eternity, that when in our faith we can see nothing, and in our spiritual disciplines we feel nothing, it is our hope in what God himself has promised and what is rooted in the depths of our heart uh, that allows us to carry on. And so in speaking specifically about resolutions, we are going to face the same exact things where uh, emotion fails us. We're not finding those resolutions to be pleasing or even beneficial, uh, but even somewhat destructive. And I think we talked a little bit about this last time when we talked about fasting, that when it is episodic, you know, the typical response to fasting is to experience bodily weakness, confusion of mind, irritability, bad mm-hmm. breath, and mm-hmm. uh, an incapacity to do our daily work as we adjust to a lower caloric intake. And if we're not praying while we're fasting, we can experience a kind of deep emptiness that goes along with that as well. And so having this kind of clarity that arises out of the psychology and the anthropology of the fathers allows us to see these things going on and how to address them. And this is what I find so beautiful about their writings, the the clarity there about Christian praxis, that the passions manifest themselves in all different kinds of ways in our life. And what we find from their wisdom are all these different remedies on a spiritual level that they embraced. And there's a kind of deep wisdom that helps us persevere in our resolutions, even when we are struggling mightily. And I think part of the issue is is that we experience a blow to our self-esteem. We experience our poverty, our weakness, sometimes our incapacity to maintain a discipline, even for a day. And it becomes very hard to humble oneself before Mm. God and to ask for for his help and his grace, and to do that day after day, and perhaps year after year, until it becomes the the reality for us. And often in my groups, when we're talking about the ascetic life, uh, I'll use the image of a drowning man. And I think maybe we even talked about this, that uh, when a person drowns, uh, someone will rush into the water, drag them to shore. Sometimes they have to be fought off because they're struggling so mightily and even knocked out and dragged to shore and have the water pumped out of their lungs. And one of the interesting psychological phenomena that arises out of that is a kind of aggression or hatred for the one who saved them. Mm -hmm. Because it's a humiliating experience to drown and to drown in the face of everybody who's watching, and to fill one's complete and utterly utter weakness and poverty in that moment. And so there's a counterintuitive thing. You would think that there would be a gratefulness there to the one who pulled you out of death's way, you know, pulled you out of harm's way. And yet the opposite can, can begin to emerge. And so psychologically, there can be a kind of resistance for us in the spiritual life, uh, uh, a psychological and spiritual resistance to embracing these kinds of resolutions, uh, because we it means acknowledging humbly our poverty before God, our need for his grace, that we cannot muscle our way to holiness or to overcoming our, our passions, that natural virtue is not the same thing as sanctity, that we are called to share in the life of God, to put on his virtue, to put on his holiness, to put on his mind. And all of this requires a deep humility where we cling to him at every single moment. And so to endure in Christian resolutions means setting aside illusions that we might not want to set aside. 
that we are making ourselves better people and uh, that we're going to lead a better life because of this. And the reality is, is that we might come to see uh, a whole host of things within us that are very dark, forms of negligence, laziness, lack of faith, selfishness. You know, as we turn that eye towards ourselves and our own hearts, we begin to see these things emerge from the depths of our unconscious, even. And this is where we get back to our opening point of having a focus upon Christ, that if we see his love and we see his mercy and we are desiring him, then even when we see our great poverty and we see our great weakness, we are not thrown into despair or despondency, but cling to him all the more. And the more that we do that, the freer we become in taking that path and even find a kind of joy and hope in it when we are no longer relying upon our own strength or the illusion of it. And I, I think Christian resolutions feel weighty for that reason. It is an impossibility to live the Christian life by one's own strength. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, we have to enter into our resolution saying, I'm taking this up in order that I might draw close to Christ so that he might sustain me, that he might heal me, that I might become what he desires me to be, to put on the identity that he's created me uh, to have. And this is going to become you know, something that takes place over the course of years. And uh, if it remains like a New Year's resolution, it's going to collapse and collapse even more quickly than New Year's resolutions do if we lose sight of, of Christ. So there is a distinctive Christian approach to making resolutions. Uh, some good contemporary examples would be Mother Teresa of Calcutta. You know, uh, in uh, some of her writings or in the book that was written about her after her, her death, that, that she attributes her growth in the spiritual life to concrete resolutions, a deepening of commitment to the Lord, to prayer. And this is what helped her grow spiritually. Elizabeth Lesore, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know of her, that her cause is underway. I think she's been, been declared servant of God. She was uh, married to an atheist, but had a deep Catholic faith on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, made specific resolutions that she would write down within her diary. And it was by doing this on a daily basis that her faith continued to grow and deepen. And after her death, uh, her sister presented her husband, who was an atheist, with this diary. And after having read it, converted to Catholicism and became a Dominican priest. Mm. And so there was something in her witness and her commitment to the Lord, her willingness to humble herself on a day-to-day -day basis and make those resolutions that touched his heart and helped bring about his, his conversion. And uh, so for us, you know, I think as we have some wonderful examples within the lives of the saints and uh, reading their writings or reading biographies about them, we see it over and over again. Another one would be Willie Doyle, Father Willie Doyle. Uh, he was an Irishman priest, Jesuit priest, who was uh, a chaplain in the military and eventually died during the Great War, uh, but was heroic in his service uh, of his men on the battlefield, putting himself in harm's way, but on a daily basis would make these resolutions, ascetical resolutions, that would strengthen him in the embrace of God's will. And we see the fruit of that in his ministry, especially when he's on the battlefield, that he's able to endure things and give himself over in the service of others, in the service of God, uh, even in such a terrifying set of circumstances. So right there are three examples, I think, we have of a powerful Christian resolution that was transformative and that brought about great conversion of heart. Yeah. Uh, but certainly going back to the fathers, 
I think, allows us to flesh out what that looks like uh, and what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we struggle with the particular things that we encounter? You know, establishing stillness externally and internally, living a simple lifestyle, dealing with the thoughts, developing uh, a deep and rich prayer life. How do we do all, all of these things, as well as uh, uh, some of the more traditional practices such as fasting? How does one embrace that in the beginning and allow it to grow and develop over the course of time? Yeah. Well, thank you, Father. I'm just uh, really grateful again for your wisdom and for sharing some of that experience with us because there's so much more that I think we could talk about. Uh, you know, we didn't go into material possessions and the effects of those, um, but there, but we'll have to have you back on to uh, to do that. And just, you know, I guess a final thought for the men listening to this episode, that encouragement of, you know, desiring Christ and always going back to that, almost expect yourself to fail, right? Like when we have that, that expectation that we're going to fail, but it's, it's how we can approach things hum uh, humbly and how we can, you know, seek a spiritual director to help you, but to, to keep on going that these things are the development of a lifetime, not just um, a moment and, and not just a new year. But isn't that such a great opportunity, though, to set things right is in that, you know, Christ makes all things new. We're here at a new year and we can we can move forward with like that. So um, I'd love any final thoughts uh, that you have to just, uh, you know, push encouragement that you haven't already done, which you you certainly have um, to, to the men listening. Uh, well, your final point, I think, yeah. I found myself wanting to say amen to that. You know, it is humility that allows us to step forward again and take up those disciplines and not become disheartened. If we see with uh, with us on the battlefield all the angels and saints and Christ himself, that's where we find the courage then to take up those disciplines where we don't see ourselves as struggling in isolation. And I think reading the fathers helps us do that as well, uh, that we see that we're not alone in the spiritual battle, that there have been thousands of men and women throughout the ages who've gone through the same struggles that we do. And there's something about that that's deeply encouraging that keeps us moving, moving forward. Yeah. Amen. And oh, all of this comes please. tied to the liturgical life, too. I think we find that it integrates our life as a whole, how we relate to others, but also our, our worship. How it is that we approach the Lord in the fundamental ways that he's given us, especially within the liturgy. And uh, you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, I'd moved to the Byzantine Rite. And part of it was, I think I went about things backwards. Uh, most people are struck by the Byzantine liturgy and find themselves attracted to it, the richness of it, uh, the nature of the chant itself, and, uh, and even some of the other spiritual traditions, the, the, the depth of their fasting and uh, that they engage in throughout the course of the year, that they're are over 150 fast days within mm. the Eastern Rite. And so it's far from being episodic. But uh, it is this spiritual tradition that of the fathers that I find linked so deeply to the divine liturgy. You know, all that I'd been reading for years, I find expressed uh, in uh, the divine liturgy in my preparation from vesting to preparing the host that is going to be used for the liturgy, all of it speaks to my heart in the same way as this spiritual tradition. And so I think East and West, uh, we need to do this for a whole host of reasons, that we might be living our Christian life, our Catholic life in all of its fullness, that our embrace of the ascetic life is going to allow us to enter into the liturgical life more deeply, not to minimalize things, but to allow it to become rich and beautiful. And similarly, our entering into a liturgical life that is deep is going to strengthen our resolutions uh, on an ascetic level on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And so time, the, our life together as a whole by these resolutions uh, becomes essential for us as Christians. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. You are in our prayers, and we're just so Go grateful ahead. for your, your time with us. It's always a pleasure. And so yeah. I hope you invite me on again. Love yeah, talking. Certainly we will. So uh, as we end every each or all of our episodes. Be a man, be a saint.